This video is part four of Diary of a German Panzer Commander, so let us get started. Our reception in Bad Kissingen was overwhelming. The Kissingers thronged the roadside and showered us with flowers. Opposite the courthouse, already closed, stood our commander to lead the march past of our battalion. There was much laughter when my Irish setter, Boy, on the cover of a truck, barked loudly at the band. The civic dignitaries naturally turned up for the reception. These Nazi functionaries sunned themselves in our success, as though the achievement had been theirs. In the following days, everyone was allowed out. Many of the restaurants and bars reopened and supplied free beer. Sepp Huber, the proprietor of the Huber Bar, produced a long hoarded bottle of scotch from his cellars. It turned into a long night. The civilian population, and most of us, thought that with the Polish campaign the war would be over. The French and the British had not attacked. Would there be a second Munich? Would the Prime Ministers Daladier and Chamberlain try again to come to terms with Hitler? Perhaps it was wishful thinking, but it seemed that, with the bloodless return home to the Reich of German-speaking territories, the occupation of the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia, and the liberation of West Prussia and Danzig in a blitzkrieg with few casualties, all the goals that redressed the injustice of the Treaty of Versailles had been achieved. But I had my doubts. Hitler's hatred of France, against whom he had fought in the First World War, was too deep. The propaganda machine was again going full blast. The names Alsace and Lorraine were also cropping up, territories that had had to be ceded in the wars of 1870-71 and 1914-18, first to Germany and then back to France. All of us in turn received leave for short visits to our families. We enjoyed those days, but reality soon caught up with us again. Me Wehrmacht, especially the armored branch, was being further enlarged. New Panzer divisions were being set up from cadres that had to be supplied by us. Our 2nd Light Division was reorganized and re-equipped to form the 7th Panzer Division. By an order of 6 February 1940, General Erwin Rommel, my infantry instructor from Dresden, became our divisional commander. He took over the Panzer Division at Bad Godesberg on the 10th. Much as we admired this man, we wondered if an infantryman could be a commander of tanks. We soon found out. Rommel had made himself thoroughly familiar with the tactics of tank warfare. A completely new wind blew among us from now on. The division was left with only a single armored reconnaissance battalion, Battalion 37, under Major Erdmann. He now became our commanding officer. Like many other commanders, he had taken part in the First World War. We respected his combat experience and at once felt confidence in him. The division received new, better tanks, the Mark III with its 5cm gun and the Mark IV with its 7.5cm stubby gun were faster, better armed and better armored. With the three-axis armored scout car and a 3.8cm gun, we received a better reconnaissance vehicle. We moved from Kissingen to the little village of Heimersheim on the northern fringe of the Rowan Mountains. Hard training began, which was made more difficult by a very severe winter. Rommel organized field exercises in all weathers, and also by night. He visited every unit daily and insisted that the same units should always work together. Thus tank people, artillerymen, and infantrymen got to know each other and became coordinated. A team was formed within the division, which was later to prove extremely important. The propaganda increased. Hitler mocked the French. He referred ever more frequently to Whiskey Churchill, and later to the paralytic Roosevelt. Was the ever-growing strength of the Wehrmacht intended to deter the Western Allies from making an attack, or did Hitler plan to enter France? We did not know. We rallied on our selvas and our modern weapons, which seemed to be superior to those of our opponents. The first SS Panzer divisions were organist. Their nucleus was made up of the Leibstandarde Adolf Hitler, Hitler's personal guard, under their commander, Sepp Dietrich. We suspected, not without reason, that with the Waffen-SS, Hitler wanted to create a counterweight to the army, especially to the conservative officer corps, and we were by no means happy about it. Although Himmler, the highest SS leader, 
assumed responsibility for the disposition of the men and their equipment, and through his influence recruited the best people for his Waffen-SS. All SS units were tactically under the control of the army, so it was still a cooperation rather than a rivalry. For want of experienced troop leaders, army officers were transferred to the Waffen-SS as commanders, and to their dismay were given SS service ranks. The severe winter of 1939-40 duly passed. In the meantime, the British had begun to move an expeditionary force to northern France. But things still remained comparatively quiet on the Western Front. In the middle of February, we were transferred to Demau on the AR, hence practically to the Western Front. Rommel visited every unit. He told us that he was proud to be permitted to lead a panzer division. Guderian, too, came to inspect and talk to us. You are the cavalry, he told us. Your job is to break through and keep going. We would thrust in a straight line to the west, to the Belgian frontier east of Louetich-Liège, hence far to the north of the French border. France, 1940 At the beginning of May, we moved west to the Eiffel Mountains. Rommel was in a nearby training area with parts of the division for practice with live ammunition, with the older commanders and reserve officers who had taken part in the First World War, we discussed what lay before us. It won't be a walkover, as in Poland, we were warned. The French and the British are quite different opponents. We younger ones replied that there could not, and must not, be any trench warfare as in 1914-18. Our tank force was too mobile for that, our attitude too positive. We youngsters thought always of Guderian and his flashing eyes when he explained his tactics to us. Rommel, the Alpine soldier of the First World War, had convinced us during our exercises that he had adapted himself to mobile warfare and was the right tank commander for us. On the evening of 9th May, we company commanders were summoned to our commanding officer, Major Erdmann. Tomorrow morning we march into Belgium. The initial resistance at the frontier must be quickly overcome. The goal of our 7th Panzer Division is the Meuse, near Dinant. Along with the 5th Panzer Division, we are part of General Holt's Panzer Corps, which will advance as spearhead through the Ardennes. Our reconnaissance battalion can take pride in being at the forefront of the division. At 0532 hours on 10 May, we fell in. The Belgian frontier posts withdrew at once or surrendered. Skirting the northern edge of Luxembourg, we advanced due west through the difficult terrain of the Ardennes, and without great resistance reached the Meuse north of Dinant on 12th of May. From the high ground we could see the valley and, on its western side, further heavily wooded hills. We could also see, however, the broken bridges, which Rommel would have liked to take intact. We felt our way slowly down into the valley, but at once came under well-directed gunfire and were straddled by heavy artillery. Rommel appeared among us, as so often in the following weeks, in order to form personally a picture of the situation. He arrived his armored car, speciality equipped with radio gear. "'What's going on?' he asked. "'Held up by artillery fire,' we replied. "'Show me. Where is the fire coming from?' Standing in his armored car, he studied the opposite bank with his binoculars. He was calm and steady, giving no sign of uncertainty or nervousness. Within minutes, he made his decision. Stay put, he told us. This is a job for the infantry. The May sun was already shining warmly. The river valley lay peacefully below us. Soon we saw elements of the 7th Panzer Grenadier Regiment climbing down the hill accompanied by army engineers with rubber dinghies. Further south, near Dinant, the 6th Panzer Grenadier Regiment was on the move. Hardly had the first boats been lowered into the water than all bell broke loose. Snipers and heavy artillery straddled the defenseless men in the boats. With our tanks and our own artillery we tried to neutralize the enemy, but he was too well screened. The infantry attack came to a standstill. Rommel went to Dinant to see whether the other regiment had been more successful, but there, too, dinghy after dinghy had been sunk. Smoke, thought Rommel. 
but we had no smoke shells. Again came one of Rommel's instant decisions made on the spot. Some houses that stood in the right direction for the wind were shot into flames, and under cover of the smoke the attack was begun again. Like a whirlwind, Rommel came back to us, at once organizing covering fire for the 7th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. He personally took command of its 2nd Battalion. With the 2nd Wave, Rommel was across the river, where it became possible to form a small bridgehead in the teeth of the French, who defended themselves bravely. During the night, the first tanks were ferried over by the engineers. On the morning of 14th of May, we took up the attack with the infantry. Rommel was there again. His command post could not hold him. His command tank was hit, and the driver put it in a ditch. Rommel was slightly wounded, but hurried forward on foot in the midst of enemy fire. Is Rommel immune? we asked ourselves. It made a strong impression on all the officers and men. His example spurred us on. From the bridgehead a breakout was successfully made. The way to the west seemed open. Our reconnaissance battalion was put across, and we at once set out from the bridgehead into the western advance. Keep going. Don't look to left or right. Only forward. I'll cover your flanks if necessary. The enemy is confused. We must take advantage of it. So ran Rommel's unorthodox orders. The Panzer Regiment moved up, and with it, a special unit of engineers. Together we managed to make a breach in the French line, one and a half miles deep. Rommel was again right up at the front, driving us on. During the night we were already advancing through the town of Avesne, and next day, the 17th, we reached the River Sambre, where the bridges were intact. The French were caught completely unawares by our impetuous advance, and retreated, to some extent, with signs of disbandment. La guerre est finie, je m'en fou, we heard, shouted by some French soldiers. What was up with the famous French army, which in the First World War had fought against us so bravely and on equal terms? In the first place, we thought, the impregnable Maginot line had given them a feeling of complete security. Second, they had undoubtedly underestimated our fighting strength and mobility. They did not draw lessons from the Blitzkrieg in Poland. In addition, the French will to wage war against us seemed to be very weak, although such outstanding leaders as Marshal Pétain and General Weygand were at the head of the French army. We had no information about the situation either in the individual sectors of the front or as a whole. We had the feeling of being alone at the head of a division advancing tempestuously. Forward, was the cry. By 18 May, our Panzer Regiment was already rolling into Cambrai, that historic town which became famous in the First World War as the place where the British first used tanks. With our reconnaissance battalion, we covered the tank advance on the left flank and were thereby involved again and again with the flood of retreating French soldiers, who in their panic mingled to a large extent with the civilian population. I, the division, closed up. On 27th of May, the important St. Quentin Canal was crossed. That evening we heard that Guderian, with three armored divisions, who had been rushing forward to the south of us, had reached Abbeville on the Somme, and was thus only fifteen miles from the Channel coast, and brought about a turning point in the war. Where were the British, whom we were now crediting with more fighting spirit? On the one hand they were tougher than the demoralized French and on the other they had their backs to the channel, which separated them from their base on the island. For them, winning was a matter of survival. On 22nd May we reached the area south of Arras. For the first time a division of the Waffen-SS appeared in support of us. We advanced on the La Basse Canal. Rommel wanted at all costs to skirt Arras on the west, so as to cut off the way to the coast for the British who were presumed to be in the area. When our tanks reached and closed the arterial road leading from Arras to the west, a hard and costly battle was about to begin for our division. I was with my company on the canal, trying to force a crossing. All the bridges had been destroyed. In addition, the French had sunk all the river boats. We were coming under accurate sniper fire from the opposite bank. As I sprang to one of our anti-tank guns to direct its fire, I received a shot in the right hand. My pistol whirled through the air. Several of my fingertips had been shot through, and I was bleeding heavily. 
as my orderly Eric Beck recalls, I at once fetched an armored car. As I tried to get my boss onto it, he slipped away under my hands. My God, I thought, now he's really had it. But next day he was back among us, with his arm in a sling. Assault parties had brought in a few prisoners, whom I questioned. After some coaxing, it turned out that the British battalion opposite us belonged to the Grenadier Guards. Its commander was an old friend of mine, with whom I had sat together in the Marlborough Club in London only shortly before the war. How senseless it all was, I thought. During the night we used rubber boats to cross and, against light opposition, succeeded in establishing a bridgehead on the other bank. Engineers had to construct the pontoon bridge like a snake through the sunken barges and lighters. During the violent crossing of the canal, Rommel stood like a target on the embankment and directed the fire, while next to him men were being wounded and even killed. Once again he spurred us on by his exemplary behavior. Only when Stukas, JU-87 dive-bombers, came into action was the crossing finally successful. Meanwhile the British had decided, even without the French, to launch a counter-attack east of Arras on our right flank. One of our Panzer Grenadier regiments caught the brunt of it. Our own were already west of Arras at the time. The situation became increasingly critical, so Rommel decided to intervene again personally. To our dismay, the British attacked with a new tank which, though slow, was well armored, the Matilda, against which our 3.7 semitometers anti-tank gun was powerless. Rommel realized this at once and brought up an 88 millimeter battery. He personally directed the 88s shot by shot, with the result that over thirty British tanks were knocked out and the enemy withdrew. Rommel never even noticed that one of his orderly officers was killed beside him. The battle for the La Basse Canal and Arras lasted several days and cost the division its heaviest casualties so far. Rommel's unorthodox tactics horrified the general staff. Even Hitler wanted to stop the headlong forward rush and order a halt to operations. But as Rommel told us, I must and will turn the favorable situation to our advantage. Our opponents are beginning to fall back and must not be allowed to find a foothold again. We believed him, trusted him, and went along with him. With two bridgeheads we pushed forward again at once and on 27th. May reached the area south of Lille. The Panzer Regiment advanced even further during the night and in the early morning was able to block the arterial road from Lille to Dunkirk at Lome. We suffered from the dust which covered the vehicles and gave us the feeling of chewing dry biscuits all the time. On 28th of May, Rommel was with his command tank at the command post of the Panzer Regiment when heavy artillery fire suddenly opened. Up, which from its direction could only have come from our own artillery. We had probably advanced too fast. Communications were not always so quick. Also with Rommel, to receive fresh orders, was my commander, Major Erdmann. Eric Beck recalls, We were just going to have breakfast when a runner came, summoning our boss von Luck to Rommel's command post. I needed a little time to pack everything. Beck, where are you, man? the boss called. I've got to go to the general. Just as we got to the outskirts of the town where we were to meet Rommel, it came under heavy artillery fife. In front of a house lay a dead man. It was our commander, Erdmann. Rommel stood nearby, brushing the dust from his uniform. Rommel seemed to be greatly affected by this death. He had lost one of his old and reliable commanders. I thought, was it thanks to our guardian angle that we left a few minutes late? Rommel turned to me. Von Luck, you will take over command of Panzer Reconnaissance Battalion 37 at once. You will receive fresh orders immediately. I was the second youngest company commander in the battalion. General, I protested, some of the company commanders are older than me. Does your decision stand in spite of that? You're in charge, full stop. If the company commanders obstruct your orders, I will replace them. This again was one of Rommel's unorthodox measures. With him, performance counted for more than rank or seniority. While securing its right flank, the whole division now advanced on the area west of Lille. The British, after their unsuccessful attempt at a counterattack, set off Operation Dynamo, the beginning of the evacuation through Dunkirk. 
On 31st May, a French division surrendered in and around Lille. The British managed to get more than 330,000 men back across the Channel to England. We could not understand why we let so many get away. As our intelligence reported, the French, after the loss of the area north of the Somme and their divisions in action there, built up a new line of defense, apparently in haste, south of the Somme, which was called, after their commander-in-chief, the Weygand Line. On the north bank of the Somme, meanwhile, our follow-up infantry divisions secured our southern flank. The 7th Panzer Division, the Phantom Division, as the French had by now respectfully christened it, was given a few days. Rest to restore men and material. On 2nd June, Rommel was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross by Hitler personally, the first divisional commander to receive it. As he presented it, Hitler remarked, We were all very worried, but success proved you right. The days of rest did us good. We could bury our dead and our fallen commander Erdmann with dignity and with military honors. The first mail went to our families. I visited my companies and thanked them for their effort. I dwelt longer with my own company, which was now being led by Staff Sergeant Werner Almus. Rommel had agreed to my suggestion that the company should be led by Almus, who was well known to all the men and NCOs, and not by an officer brought in from the officer reserve. I enjoined all the men to behave correctly toward the civilian population and not play the conqueror. The inhabitants rewarded us for this behavior. Not once did we hear the words Saul Bosch, dirty German. During these days medals were awarded with due ceremony. I received the Iron Cross First Class. After the award of the Knight's Cross, Rommel came back from Hitler's advanced headquarters at Cherryville and sent for us commanders to issue us new orders. The gist of what he said was as follows. The advance movement has led to complete success. Now it is a matter of encircling the British and preventing the bulk of them from retreating to their island. The enemy is exposed to annihilation, he went on in his Swabian dialect. We shall thrust forward across the Somme to the Seine and not bother about our opponents, whom we will overtake or leave behind on our right and left flanks. Our goal is the Seine, which we must reach at Rouen, on the right wing of the Corps. In so doing, we shall try to capture the Seine bridges intact. Carry on as before. I have complete confidence in you. On 5 and 6 June we advanced in open battle order across the flat terrain, avoiding the main roads, along which the civilian population and retreating elements of the French 10th Army were moving south. We reached the Somme and took ion of its bridges, surprisingly intact. Always up at the front was the reconnaissance battalion. After us came the tanks, then the grenadier regiments, and the artillery. We no longer bothered about the enemy and had not time to take prisoners. On the far side of the Somme we suddenly came upon resistance, the way and line. I had the motorcycle escorts break off and attack under covering fire. I was with them myself and was forced to take cover as we came under heavy artillery fire. Then I heard a voice behind me. Captain, your breakfast. I turned around and Cafort believed my eyes. One of my runners, Lance Corporal Fritsche, a hotelier from the Sarland, had crawled forward through enemy fire carrying a tray with some sandwiches, which were even garnished with parsley and a paper napkin. Man, are you mad? I'm hungry all right but at the moment I have other things to do than eat breakfast. Yes, I know, but a hungry commander gets nervous. I feel responsible for your welfare. And he was off again, back through the fire. The men around me, who were lying in full cover, just shook their heads and found it quite in order that I was able, somewhat later, to pin the Iron Cross II class on this man. With the support of tanks and artillery, the Weygand line was successfully breached. In only two days we covered about a hundred kilometers of open terrain, and on 7 June reached the Seine at Rouen. There the Luftwaffe had done quite a job. From afar we could already see huge clouds of black smoke hanging in the sky. From the hills on the southern edge of Rouen we saw the burning oil tanks and the harbor, but also the Seine bridges, 
every one of which had been destroyed. I reported this to Rommel, who ordered the hills to be held until the arrival of new instructions. It will be a hard crossing, we all thought to ourselves. Next day came the new order. The division will leave the Seine and turn west, so as to reach the channel coast north of Le Havre. In the harbors between Le Havre and Dieppe, there are said to be British units still, waiting to be evacuated. On 8 and 9th June we pushed forward in the direction of the Channel Coast. The French and British covered the planned evacuation with hastily constructed lines of defense. At this point, I received from Rommel one of his unorthodox mad commissions. After my battalion had reached its first objective on the evening of 8th June, and in so doing had thrust at times straight through French columns without bothering about prisoners or resistance on our flanks, just as Rommel had ordered, he appeared at my command post, sat down at a table, and studied the map. Von Luck, you will fall in tomorrow morning before daylight and push through to the west for about thirty kilometers. There you will reach a hill from which you can overlook the whole terrain. Take the hill and establish yourself there until I arrive with the tanks. Don't look to left or right, only forward all the time. If you get into difficulties, let me know. My intelligence had reported, meanwhile, that the Allies had set up a strong anti-tank front five kilometers to the west. It was obvious to me that I could not possibly reach the objective with my lightly armed recce battalion, but I knew Rommel, and knew that he set goals as distantly as possible, and that he would not tolerate contradiction, but expected his commanders to try and do as well as they could. I was able to observe again and again— especially in North Africa how commanders opposed his orders, which often seemed impossible to carry out, and were promptly replaced. So, without raising objections, I said, General, I have understood your commission. As I see from the map, the hill to be taken is only about ten kilometers from the coast. Why shouldn't I push on at once to the channel, then we could at least have a bath? Rommel laughed. He liked such reactions from his commanders. So we fell in next morning and, as was to be anticipated, came upon strong anti-tank defenses, against which we had nothing to throw in. We made only five kilometers progress in all. I reported this to Rommel, shortly after he came to us and satisfied himself personally of the situation. I'll have artillery laid on at once and have some tanks pushed through, then proceed as before in accordance with my orders. The eyes of the men around me were shining. They had faith in Rommel, and knew that he would give no orders that endangered their lives unnecessarily. Rommel's tactics worked, we got through, and resumed the advance. On 9 June we reached the coast. Rommel sent off his famous signal to headquarters. Am at sea. Further north lay the little port of saint valery sur somme in which, according to aerial reconnaissance, there were still considerable Allied forces. Rommel sent for me. I am going to take St. Valéry with the division. You will keep one eighty millimeter battery as support, and take the little port of Fécamp south of here and secure the Le Havre direction. While Rommel advanced with the division on St. Valéry, where he encountered stiff resistance, there began for my armored reconnaissance battalion one of the oddest, indeed almost amusing, episodes of the French campaign. With scout car patrols in front, to keep a lookout and protect us against surprise, we marched along the clifftop road the thirty or so kilometers to the south. We met with no opposition. Here even civilian traffic had petered gut. By the evening of 90 June we were on the hills north of Fécamp. We moved quietly, for no one was supposed to know of our presence. We had to exploit the effect of surprise. We could see the little harbor in which lay two British destroyers. They were obviously there for the evacuation. We could see the promenade with pretty villas and a casino, as we supposed. In the harbor and on the streets we could detect a good deal of enemy movement. The French and British seemed to be preparing for embarkation. To our astonishment, neither the vehicle movements. I sent for Kardorf, my orderly officer. Kardorf spoke fluent French, having attended a French school in Berlin. Kardorf. Tomorrow morning you will go to Fécamp with a runner and a white flag. 
Ask for the local commander and demand the surrender of the whole garrison. Tell him that the town is surrounded on all sides and that the two destroyers must leave the harbor immediately without taking anyone on board. All clear? Early in the morning, Cardorf went off. We saw him disappear into the town. Would my trick work? After a short time, Cardorf came back. The mayor and the French commandant seem to agree, but the British flatly decline. What now? I couldn't lose face, so had to go on with the game. Toward ten was a.m., I sent for Cardorf once more. Go into the town again and tell the mayor that I should like to spare his beautiful resort. He might care to exert his influence on the Allied commanders in the interests of the inhabitants. There is no escape, only unnecessary loss. If the garrison again declines to surrender, I will open fire on the town and harbor at twelve o'clock with every gun, and call up the Luftwaffe for bombardment. Kardorf went into the town once more and again came back with a refusal. I sent for the company commanders and the leader of the 88 mm battery. We shall have to keep our word now and open fire on the town punctually at twelve o'clock, I said. Apart from the 88s, I had only a 3.7 mm anti-tank gun, the two semi guns of the scout cars, and the normal machine gun equipment of the motorcycle escorts. So my orders were, Punctually at 1200 hours fire will be opened from every gun, including signal pistols, to pretend that we're stronger than we really are. The 88s will try to set the destroyers on fire, aim for the gun turrets and the bridges, Everybody made preparations. We were in a strange mood. No one wanted to destroy this famous resort. At eleven-thirty, a civilian came up the hill. He held a white cloth in his hand. He was brought before me. "'What's going on in the town, monsieur? Why doesn't your mayor surrender the place?' I asked him. "'Tell me where the British are and which buildings are important.' The man said he had been afraid, and that was why he had run away." The British were mainly in the harbor, preparing the embarkation. They're clearing out and leaving us to our fate. Please spare the town. Look, the building over there is the old Benedictine monastery. There in the middle is the old town hall. And there, on the promenade, is our casino. I put two and two together and asked, The monastery, is that where the famous Benedictine liqueur is made? Yes, that's the place, he replied. At that I sent for the commanders again and gave directions. The monastery, the town hall, and the casino are not to be touched. Concentrate on the harbor and the radio station. The 88s will destroy the radio station first and then concentrate on the destroyers. Luck was on our side. A few minutes before twelve, a squadron of Luftwaffe bombs flew over the town, obviously on their way to England. In addition, one machine dropped three bombs, whether by mistake or to hit the destroyers, we didn't know. At the same moment I ordered fire. A somewhat ineffective but nonetheless intensive hail of shots fell on the harbor, nor the town itself was secured by outposts on the high ground. No one seemed to be expecting us. The evening sun bathed this pretty resort in a warm light. Bearing in mind the relative forces and the presence of the two destroyers, I thought of a plan for the following morning, which I explained that evening to the company commanders and the leader of the 88mm battery. The hills before Fecomp will be occupied by the motorcycle escorts. The armored scout cars will hold back so that they can intervene where necessary. The heavy company will secure the motorcycle escorts. The 88s will be positioned on the cliffs in such a way that they can attack the two destroyers, both in the harbor and at sea should they leave it. Everything must be done without attracting attention. No loud commands, no unnecessary vehicle movements. I sent for Kardorf, my orderly officer. Kardorf spoke fluent French, having attended a French school in Berlin. Kardorf, tomorrow morning you will go to Fecamp with a runner and a white flag. Ask for the local commander and demand the surrender of the whole garrison. Tell him that the town is surrounded on all sides and that the two destroyers must leave the harbor immediately without taking anyone on board. All clear? Early in the morning, Kardorf went off. We saw him disappear into the town. Would my trick work? After a short time, Kardorf came back. 
The mayor and the French commandant seem to agree, but the British flatly decline. What now? I couldn't lose face, so had to go on with the game. Toward ten hours a.m., I sent for Cardorf once more. Go into the town again, and tell the mayor that I should like to spare his beautiful resort. He might care to exert his influence on the Allied commanders in the interests of the inhabitants. There is no escape, only unnecessary loss. If the garrison again declines to surrender, I will open fire on the town and harbor at twelve o'clock with every gun, and call up the Luftwaffe for bombardment. Cardorf went into the town once more and again came back with a refusal. I sent for the company commanders and the leader of the 88 Ninel Battery. We shall have to keep our word now and open fire on the town punctually at twelve o'clock, I said. Apart from the 88s, I had only a three-point-cent-centimeters anti-tank gun, the two-centimeter guns of the scout cars and the normal machine-gun equipment of the motorcycle escorts. So my orders were, punctually at twelve hundred hours fire will be opened from every gun, including signal pistols to pretend that we're stronger than we really are. The 88s will try to set the destroyers on fire, aim for the gun turrets and the bridges. Everybody made preparations. We were in a strange mood. No one wanted to destroy this famous resort. At 11.30 a civilian came up the hill. He held a white cloth in his hand. He was brought before me. "'What's going on in the town, monsieur? Why doesn't your mayor surrender the place?' I asked him. Tell me where the British are and which buildings are important. The man said he had been afraid, and that was why he had run away. The British were mainly in the harbor, preparing the embarkation. They're clearing out and leaving us to our fate. Please spare the town. Look, the building over there is the old Benedictine monastery. There in the middle is the old town hall. And there, on the promenade, is our casino. I put two and two together and asked, the monastery. Is that where the famous Benedictine liqueur is made? Yes, that's the place, he replied. At that I sent for the commanders again and gave directions. The monastery, the town hall, and the casino are not to be touched. Concentrate on the harbor and the radio station. The 88s will destroy the radio station first, and then concentrate on the destroyers. Luck was on our side. A few minutes before twelve, a squadron of Luftwaffe bombs flew over the town, obviously on their way to England. In addition, one machine dropped three bombs, whether by mistake or to hit the destroyers we didn't know. At the same moment I ordered, Fire! A somewhat ineffective but nonetheless intensive hail of shots fell on the harbor like fireworks. We all had to laugh as blue, red, and yellow tracer ammunition provided a backdrop. Suddenly a white flag went up over the town hall. Capitulation. The two destroyers left the harbor full steam ahead and began to shoot at our positions. Unfortunately, that cost us a few casualties until the 88s managed to hit one of the destroyers, which continued its voyage under a smoke screen. I at once ordered ceasefire and summoned Kardorf. We will both go into the town now and arrange the surrender. At that moment, a couple of Wellington bombers came flying toward us. The 88s opened fire immediately. One machine went down in flames. The crew hung from their parachutes and landed right in my positions. You're in luck, I greeted them. You'll be staying here with me for the time being. We then set off in a scout car on our journey into the town, where the mayor handed me the key to the resort. Monsieur le maire, I ordered your town hall, the monastery, and the casino not to be hit out of respect for these historic buildings. La guerre est fini pour vous. Bring the inhabitants out of the cellars. Open the shops. We will pay in genuine currency. Nothing will happen to any of you. In all those weeks I had seldom seen such a grateful and surprised Frenchman as that mayor. While I stayed with him, I sent Cardorf up the hill to bring the commanders to me. I ordered the southern hills to be occupied, the radio station to be switched off and feelers to be put out to the south by reconnaissance patrols. The town was to be hermetically sealed on all sides. Half of every unit was to have a few hours free in turn, to take a bath in the sea, and to go shopping. I reported by radio to Romil that Fecamp had been captured with light casualties, only a half dozen. 
that many French and British had been made prisoner, nearly two hundred men, and that protective measures had been taken to the south. Rommel radioed back. Bravo von Luck, you remain responsible for the town. My ultimatum for the surrender of St. Valery has been rejected. I am preparing bomb attacks and an attack with tanks. The following day, Rommel radioed, St. Valery has surrendered. Several generals, including the commander of the 51st Highland Division, and thousands of prisoners taken. The division has one to two days rest. We were overdoyed. On the spur of the moment, I asked Rommel by radio. Can you send me the divisional band? The inhabitants are grateful and friendly. In addition, I have sealed off the town on all sides, even to German visitors, except for you personally, of course. Have I your agreement? Rommel understood a bit of fun. He was in a good mood after his success and consented to both the band and the sealing off of the town. With the major and my adjutant, I now viewed the resort. We first visited the Benedictine Monastery, where we were greeted by the abbot. Monsieur El Abbe, I should have called him Monsieur. I heard about your monastery at the last minute before the shelling of the town, and at once ordered that no shot was to fall on your building. I hope everything is intact. The abbot thanked me effusively for our forbearance and asked whether he might show me the monastery. I am somewhat ashamed to admit that the Benedictine liqueur was one of the decisive factors in sparing the monastery. As we descended to the cellars, I could see thousands of bottles and a large number of old barrels. Does the famous Benedictine come from these cellars? I asked innocently. It certainly does. And to show our gratitude, I should like to offer all your men a bottle. The abbot paled when I told him the strength of my unit, one to one hundred men. But he kept his word. Since that day, I have always drunk Benedictine with particular respect. On the afternoon of 12th June, probably for the only time during the campaign, a German band gave a promenade concert in front of the casino. French and German soldiers strolled about together on the promenade and were glad that the battle for Fécamp had been executed so bloodlessly. I instructed my hotelier, the runner, with the breakfast to do some shopping and prepare a meal for that evening in the casino. He was now in his element. Then the mayor appeared with a German U-boat officer whose ship had been shot up in the channel. He was the only one to be taken prisoner by the French. In the excitement of yesterday we forgot that we had this gentleman in our prison, the mayor apologized. Sitting together at the festive table that evening were the officers of the battalion, the successful leader of the 88 mm battery, a German U-boat officer, and the crew of a British Wellington bomber, besides the mayor of Fecamp. I at once ordered ceasefire and summoned Cardorf. We will both go into the town now and arrange the surrender. At that moment a couple of Wellington bombers came flying toward us. The 88s opened fire immediately. One machine went down in flames. The crew hung from their parachutes and landed right in my positions. You're in luck, I greeted them. You'll be staying here with me for the time being. We then set off in a scout car on our journey into the town, where the mayor handed me the key to the resort. Monsieur le maire, I ordered your town hall, the monastery, and the casino, not to be hit out of respect for these historic buildings. La guerre est finie pour vous. Bring the inhabitants out of the cellars, open the shops. We will pay in genuine currency. Nothing will happen to any of you. In all those weeks I had seldom seen such a grateful and surprised Frenchman as that mayor. While I stayed with him, I sent Cardorf up the hill to bring the commanders to me. I ordered the southern hills to be occupied, the radio station to be switched off, and feelers to be put out to the south by reconnaissance patrols. The town was to be hermetically sealed on all sides. Half of every unit was to have a few hours free in turn, to take a bath in the sea, and to go shopping. I reported by radio to Rommel that Fécamp had been captured with light casualties. Only a half dozen, that many French and British had been made prisoner, nearly two hundred men, and that protective measures had been taken to the south. Rommel radioed back, Bravo von Luck, you remain responsible for the town. My ultimatum for the surrender of St. Valéry has been rejected. I am preparing bomb attacks and an attack with tanks. The following day Rommel radioed, St. Valéry has surrendered.
several generals, including the commander of the 51st Highland Division, and thousands of prisoners taken. The division has one to two days rest. We were overdoyed. On the spur of the moment I asked Rommel by radio, Can you send me the divisional band? The inhabitants are grateful and friendly. In addition, I have sealed off the town on all sides, even to German visitors, except for you personally, of course. Have I your agreement? Rommel understood a bit of fun. He was in a good mood after his success and consented to both the band and the sealing off of the town. With the major and my adjutant, I now viewed the resort. We first visited the Benedictine Monastery, where we were greeted B.E., the abbot. Monsieur Il Abbe. I should have called him Monsieur. I heard about your monastery at the last minute before the shelling of the town, and at once ordered that no shot was to fall on your building. I hope everything is intact. The abbot thanked me effusively for our forbearance and asked whether he might show me the monastery. I am somewhat ashamed to admit that the Benedictine liqueur was one of the decisive factors in sparing the monastery. As we descended to the cellars, I could see thousands of bottles and a large number of old barrels. "'Does the famous Benedictine come from these cellars?' I asked innocently. "'It certainly does, and to show our gratitude I should like to offer all your men a bottle.' The abbot paled when I told him the strength of my unit." one thousand hundred men. But he kept his word. Since that day I have always drunk Benedictine with particular respect. On the afternoon of 12th of June, probably for the only time during the campaign, a German band gave a promenade concert in front of the casino. French and German soldiers strolled about together on the promenade and were glad that the battle for Fécamp had been executed so bloodlessly. I instructed my hôtelier, the runner with the breakfast, to do some shopping and prepare a meal for that evening in the casino. He was now in his element. Then the mayor appeared with a German U-boat officer whose ship had been shot up in the channel. He was the only one to be taken prisoner by the French. In the excitement of yesterday we forgot that we had this gentleman in our prison, the mayor apologized. Sitting together at the festive table that evening were the officers of the battalion, the successful leader of the 88 mm battery, a German U-boat officer, and the crew of a British Wellington bomber, besides the mayor of Fekamp. On 15 and 16th June we were set on the march again, Le Havre was left alone, and would be taken by other units. Rommel told us that we were now to cross the Seine. The bridges had been rebuilt, and substantial bridgeheads secured. Our goal now was the naval port of Cherbourg which had been developed as a fortress, and was to become an important base for our navy. We crossed the Seine on 17th of June and literally stormed through Normandy toward Cherbourg. On that day we covered nearly 350 kilometers. Our reconnaissance battalion, because of its greater mobility, again forming the spearhead. Early on 18th of June we were at the outer forts of the Cherbourg Citadel, Rommel at once called for Stukas, which bombed fort after fort. On 19th of June, at a formal ceremony, the French commandant surrendered the fortress. Rommel was very courteous and paid tribute to the garrison. I believe this fair attitude, which he himself always showed toward the defeated enemy, earned him respect even abroad. Rommel was already somewhat vain, but we were happy to overlook this, he always had his camera on hand to photograph the most important scenes. He was taken to task later because he had obviously improved the figures for his achievements. In the main, though, it was his unconventional mode of fighting that evoked the criticism of him and also the envy of some senior officers. According to Rommel's account, the division had taken 97,648 prisoners in six weeks against losses of its own of 1,600 dead and wounded certainly a proud balance. We did not stop at Cherbourg, but pushed on south at once through Brittany, in the general direction of Rennes and Nantes on the Loire. A captured French captain told Rommel, as I translated, that Marshal Pétain had offered an armistice. In spite of that, we advanced further south so as to control, if possible, the whole Atlantic coast. Saint-Nazaire and La Rochelle fell into our hands. Practically no resistance was offered any more. 
the stream of refugees gradually dried up. Half of Paris seemed to have fled south to the Mediterranean coast and to Bordeaux. On 21st June, the armistice was signed at Compipe. Of its provisos, we at first heard nothing. On, we went south. Bordeaux is our goal, said Rommel. When I arrived with the first elements of my reconnaissance battalion at the Gironde, a river north of Bordeaux, Rommel told us to stop. At a briefing of commanders, we heard that Pétain was still in Thordo with his provisional government, but would be transferring his seat to Vichy, in the part of France not to be occupied by us. "'You will secure the area by the river with your battalion,' Rommel ordered. "'Give your men some time to rest. With the armistice, the French campaign is over and won.' I posted an armored patrol and some motorcycle escorts at the northern approach to the bridge. My people relaxed and behaved in exemplary fashion toward the inhabitants.' 